delighted to welcome you here to uh, the CAS Business School, to this inaugural um, Business New Europe IntelliNews uh, debate. We're here to not just debate an important motion with uh, informed and influential uh, people, and more about them in a moment. We're here also to raise a glass to the, this newly merged business. Um, BNE's been around for a long time. Many of you will read it, of course. IntelliNews has been around even longer. Um, both Jim Hammond, the founder of IntelliNews, and Ben Aris, the founder of BNE, are very much here um, uh, in, the, in the flesh. Um, they've joined forces, uh, and this follows a major investment uh, in our company uh, by Jerome Booth, the uh, co-founder of the Ashmore uh, Asset Management Company. Uh, first and foremost, I'd like to uh, hand the microphone to our uh, esteemed uh, host, uh, the Deputy Dean of CAS Business School, Paul Palmer. Thank you. I hope, can everyone hear me? Okay, so CAS Business School is part of the City University of London. We're, uh, we're all rather excited at the present moment in CAS because um, we've uh, just recently gone through uh, the two exercises, the most recent one being what's called the Research Excellence Framework. It's where we're tested for our research and we have um, we felt a little bit disappointed in the previous one because we knew our research was world leading but uh, what part of our uh, we didn't get as much credit as we should have done and this time round uh, a wrong has been righted uh, so we're rather excited because 80% uh, of CAS's staff are actually ranked now as uh, research excellent and the latest MBA shows that our MBA uh, continues to be in the top 10 uh, in, in the financial times ranking so, uh, but CAS is really more than just simply the business school that does courses and research. And I think the, the purpose of this evening, and indeed uh, why I am going to now mention Jerome, is that a distinguishing feature of this business school is, of course, its location in the City of London, which also means that we have, well, in my view, probably the world's finest visiting faculty. Because when you've got, you're surrounded by the world's experts, which the City of London clearly has, then you'll be mad as a business school not to draw upon it. So uh, part of my role is to make sure that uh, wonderful people like Jerome um, engage with us. We've, um, he has, of course, a PhD in his own right, uh, but he's also a visiting professor of the school, comes in and does various lectures for us. And that provides that interface between academia and practitioner, and is a real value to, to, to our students and, and equipping them uh, for the future. So uh, we are delighted this evening to support this event. It's everything we're about in terms of what universities should be about, in terms of debates and whatever. Um, we hotly disputed which CAS academic should sit here. But it turned out that our wider economics faculty, uh, Michael is the, uh, the more the expert in this area. So we've, uh, we've transferred Michael in. He said to me, do you think your dean or my dean would prefer to have me here? Um, you're very welcome, Michael, I would say. Um, incredibly distinguished panel. I'm going to hand back to Liam now and just to say a warm welcome to you all again. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, welcome everybody once again. Welcome to those joining us on our, on our live stream uh, from around the world at this BNE and Telenews uh, debate. Uh, in your debate packs, you'll see the latest copy of our magazine, literally hot off the, the, the presses. You'll see a, a, a list of uh, speakers with their biographies uh, and a list of BNE products and testimonials. You know, it's just 25 years, uh, just over 25 years since the fall of the Berlin Wall, of course, marking. Uh, what some people call the end of history, uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union and the demise of state planning across CIS and Eastern Europe, the subsequent dissolution of the Warsaw Pact, of course, ushered in uh, an era when history, in my view, rather than ending, significantly sped up. Uh, developments that took decades or even centuries in other parts of the world have been compressed into just a few tumultuous years. And diverse nations once lumped together in the news bulletins of my youth as the Warsaw Pact, the Eastern Bloc, uh, across them, control prices have been liberalised, voucher privatisation spread, constitutions have been hastily rewritten, and companies began to incorporate. Above all, people living across this region, the region covered by BNE and Telenews, 
previously living under com communism in their hundreds of millions were suddenly able to work for themselves, get a job, do business, travel, consume foreign media, express themselves. Of course, the transition has been confused and chaotic and in many countries still has a long way to go. There will be disputes on this panel, but I think on balance, we'd all agree it's surely good news that economic and political freedoms have been extended, right, Ed? And business across this region, <laughs> while often unpredictable, is actually uh, booming. It's all right, you can rip it off later. Um, Eastern Europe, Russia, and Central Asia combined, a market of 350 million people, hundreds of thousands of companies, a combined market capitalism of $2 trillion. These are the markets covered by our publications. We hope uh, in a manner that's uh, uh, f uh, fair uh, and rational and, above all, analytical. The ideological battles of the Cold War are over, but we do now see the East and West, don't we, at loggerheads to varying degrees by proxy in Iraq, Syria, Libya, and in a kind of co Cold War throwback in Eastern Ukraine, of course. All these events, whatever view you take of them, and there are many different views in this room, demonstrate that globalization hasn't brought the end of history, and it certainly hasn't brought global government, governance. Since the Berlin Wall fell, a pattern of officially recognized, easily explained conflicts has given way to a belligerent, belligerent mess. And now, of course, what with EU-Russia sanctions against EU sanctions, US sanctions against Russia, and Moscow's response, East-West relations, despite the huge business links between us, uh, and over a quarter of a century of free movement, uh, are, are at a new cold, cold post-war low. So is this renewed conflict a temporary lapse, or is it the new normal? That's what we're here to debate today. I'm going to be extremely strict with uh, this panel. Um, it's a very, very experienced group of people. I'm delighted they've all uh, taken upon themselves to come here uh, and join us. I feel uh, this is a real uh, privileged position that we're in to be here. And I'm going to limit each panel member to a single minute, their opening thoughts. And then we're going to open up for discussion and bring the audience in as well. We've got about 55 minutes. Sir Roderick Braithwaite, you're first. You've got less than 55 minutes already. Start your stopwatch. Five points. <laughs> uh, first of all, let's not be sentimental. Suspicion, fear, mutual disapproval, and occasional bouts of violence have always characterized the relationship between Russia and the West, and they are the norm. So what we're seeing now is not a new normal, it's the old norm. Ukraine, both sides, both sides meddled in a very fragile Ukraine after 1992. But uh, I'm sure Ed and I agree on one thing, if not many, which is that the Russians bear the immediate responsibility for the current mess. And as far as that's concerned, that's not going to stop. Neither side is going to pull back for a long time. Meanwhile, I think the one thing we can all do is avoid rhetoric. And I think talk of a new Cold War simply confuses the issue, not least because what's going on now is very, very dissimilar to the real Cold War and the nuclear confrontation. Over. Okay, that's the message from uh, the British ambassador at the time the Soviet Union collapsed. Uh, Ed Lucas, author of The New Cold War, your response in a minute, please. Well, it's awful to be proved right. I wish that my book had just been um, seen as a bizarre footnote to history. It's not just about Ukraine. The trajectory of repression at home and aggression abroad has been clear long before the war in Ukraine, long before the war in Georgia. The Baltic states and people like Václav Havel were warning us about this 10 or even 15 years ago. And those warnings from Estonians and Latvians and Lithuanians and Poles and Czechs and others were ignored and belittled and patronized by people in the West who said they were exaggerating, they were suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder, and they didn't really understand Russia. Actually, it was we who didn't, in the West who didn't understand Russia. Maybe because of sentiment, maybe because of naivety, or maybe actually because of cynicism, because we were riding first class in the Kremlin gravy, gravy train, the bankers and lawyers and accountants in this country who are profiting so hugely um, from the tens of billions of dollars that were being stolen from the Russian people and possibly didn't see things as clear as they could. We're losing the new Cold War. I wish we weren't. We can get into debate about what we need to do and how we can win it. Thank you. Pippa? Pippa Malgram, of course, is known to many people as a, a widely known commentator on many uh, 
TV channels from the Ditchley Foundation as well. She's also just authored a, a book uh, on geopolitics. I read it in draft, I'm happy to say, uh, called Signals. Pippa, where do you stand on this, uh, this spectrum between Sir Roderick and Ed Lucas? So uh, the interesting thing is we have a whole generation of business leaders, fund managers, who have grown up since the fall of the Berlin Wall. So they think that normal is having virtually no geopolitics. Uh, I grew up before that uh, at Ground Zero in Washington, D.C., practiced diving underneath my desk once a month, which was apparently safer if you were in a direct nuclear hit. <laughs> I don't know why. At any rate, uh, which caused me to study military history, which caused me to be very interested in this whole subject of the post-war international order, which both Russia and China are deeply challenging. And uh, while I wouldn't give them any excuse in how the West has conducted itself, I would say they are asking bigger questions than we may realize. And the conflicts we're going to see, particularly with Russia, it is wrong to think this is isolated in Ukraine. This goes from the Arctic to the Mediterranean to the Black Sea and beyond. This is a large strategic confrontation. And I think in the West, we maybe don't credit that. Thank you, Pippa. Um, next we, up, we have Eric Bergloff. Eric Bergloff is an extremely well-known uh, policy advisor, uh, economist for many years, uh, chief economist at the EBRD. Uh, we'd like to have you here, Eric. Eric has just left the EBRD to start a new uh, public policy school uh, at the London School of Economics called the Institute for Global Affairs. Eric, your view, please. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, there is nothing normal about this uh, so-called new normal. It's uh, very abnormal. It's uh, massive trade diversions, massive redundancy being built into the system, uh, massive uh, suboptimal investments or uh, no investment that should be happen happening. So the question is not to, you know, how to exceed, uh, ex exceed our, each other in terms of how, we, how bad the situation is. The, the, the challenge is really how to how can we get out of this mess? And that's, I think, should be the topic of the evening. Thank you, Eric. Um, Michael Bengad is a macroeconomist based at City University, also has experience living and working, uh, particularly in Georgia. Uh, I suppose as an academic economist, my starting point is whether Vladimir Putin and the people who advise him are rational actors who can be deterred if the West makes the price of further aggression high and more importantly, certain enough. I think that all the signs are that he may be aggressive and occasionally may seem petulant, but he's no madman pouring over the works of Alexander Dugin late at night, though he may find it profitable for us to believe so. What does worry me is that Western policy vis-a-vis -vis the defense of Eastern Europe is highly reminiscent of Foreign Secretary Edward Gray's constructively ambiguous guarantees made to France just over 100 years ago. Convinced Britain would enter the war, France encouraged its Russian ally to mobilize, while Germany equally convinced that Britain would remain neutral, pushed Austria-Hungary to attack Serbia. Just because actors are rational does not mean in a world of imperfect information that they do not gamble or miscalculate. Uh, given the way the West has ignored the commitments it made to Ukraine under the 1994 Budapest Memorandum, uh, it's an open question why Putin should take NATO's Article 5 commitments to say Estonia any more seriously. Thank you very much, Michael. Sandra Wood, uh, another former British ambassador to Moscow, also to Yugoslavia. Uh, first of all, I ha hate your title. <laughs> Andrew, sorry. <laughs> because it's East versus West. Yeah. There is no East, it's Russia. Russia is the problem. Russia is going through a, an increasingly serious political crisis, an economic crisis, and it's overreached itself in Ukraine. It's under significant time constraint to persuade the West to accept its point of view that it's uh, going to be in charge in uh, Ukraine. I agree strongly that there is no normal in this situation. Uh, people refer to um, <clears throat> Putin's high ratings. Well, I read recently that Honecker had about 70% high ratings when uh, the Berlin Wall was about to collapse. The question is, when will Russia begin to change its system of government? Can it change it without a violent end? Because in the end, it's going to have to do it. And that would be true whether or not the West remains united or um, somewhat hesitant and divided. 
It remains important and true, not just for the West, but for Central Asia, in fact, for all of, all of Russia's neighbours. This is a crisis about Russia. Thank you. And uh, next to Sir Andrew is Ben Aris, the founder of uh, Business New Europe, who spent much of the last 20 years uh, living and working uh, in the region, particularly in Russia. Ben. My perspective is uh, I was first <coughs> in the CIS Ukraine, uh, May 1993, and then up to Russia, to Moscow, uh, in time for the coup and the tanks. And this is how we look at the region, uh, starting at the benchmark of shortly after the collapse of the Soviet Union <coughs> compared to today. And what I've seen uh, in all of the countries, not just Russia, is a change, an astronomical, historical change from basket cases, countries with hyperinflation, people with life savings inflated away to nothing, to what is today more or less a normal country with some big problems. And that's what we, we look at, is the progress, the, the vector of, you know, of, of development and, uh, and growth, whereas most of the coverage of Russia is with Russia today compared to London today, whereas we're doing Russia today compared to Russia 1993. And this is a totally different perspective. And then to try and compare and hold Russia and all the other countries to those values of the developed world uh, is nonsensical. What we should be looking at is the vector that they're going on, the transition, the movement, the convergence towards the West. And this is a long and painful and difficult process. The guys in charge now have come out of the old system. They don't get the new one. And they're learning, but they're learning slowly. And these miscalculations have led to conflict, misunderstanding, and unfortunately now into a military conflict, uh, proxy war, a new Cold War. In fact, finally, I'll say that we actually got the jump on it because we called the new Cold War in a peace cover piece in April 2013 because we could see it coming, the rearmament. Uh, and this is entirely predictable from these miscalculations. Thank you. So, Ed, do you think sanctions on uh, Russia, uh, EU, US sanctions on Russia have been a success? I think that the track record of using economic sanctions to make countries do what we want is fairly weak, and I'd give Zimbabwe as an example. Mm -hmm. I think if we really wanted to impose sanctions, we'd go up after the Russian dirty money in the West, um, particularly start scaring some of the people in London who've been accomplices in the, in the, in the theft of the, se of the century. Um, I think that we could do a lot more on the visa sanctions. It's astonishing that one of the best-known people in Russia has both a daughter at LSE and a mistress living in Knightsbridge. I won't mention him by name because it's being live-streamed. I think we could con considerably inconvenience people in, in that regard. Um, I think the sanctions are important as an expression of will by the EU and a sign that we're to be taken seriously. And if we, um, this war in Ukraine continues to escalate, I hope, although I'm not particularly optimistic, that they, that they will um, impose tighter ones. I think perhaps the most important thing is that the um, United States criminal justice system might be brought to bear on some of the Kremlin money laundering outfits, and there have been some leaks in the media to, the, to, to, to that, in, um, that, that ex, um, in that direction. And I think if that happened, that would be a very serious sanction indeed, and I hope it does. Do you think, Sir Roderick, they've been successful? Do you want to see sanctions get tougher or less tough? I don't think it's anything like the moment for them to get less tough. Uh, I think that sanctions do work. The most successful sanctions in the past 50 years were, of course, the ones that were imposed on the United Kingdom by the United States in 1956, and they worked in about three days flat. But um, the fact is that sanctions do grind a country down. I think it's clear sanctions are having an effect in Russia. I think it's also true that it's much too early to assume that they have either succeeded or failed. I also think it's true that they're not going to be lifted soon because that would send the wrong signal. And actually, Ed, uh, I agree with you about the city of London. And it's not, only, it's not only money from Russia which gets laundered there. And there's certainly a lot more could be done about that. But, of course, it is the jewel in the crown of the British economy, the City of London, so it probably won't be. Separating abscess, not a jewel. <laughs> <laughs> Eric, in your role um, uh, at the EBRD, you see an awful lot of um, attempts to conduct business um, in Russia and in Eastern Europe. What impact do you think sanctions have had, and how have they gone down among um, the folk in the business community that you've spent uh, much of the last uh, ten years dealing with? Well, I, th I think it's no question that the sanctions are working. Uh, it's not so much actually the sanctions themselves, but it's the 
potential for additional sanction, the uncertainty that's created around the sanctions. We actually lived inside the sanctions because EBRD was actually used as a sanctions tool. And I can tell you how much time we spent trying to figure out, you know, what do these sanctions actually mean? What does it mean not to allow new investments? It's not as clear as you, you might think. And it, there were periods where we met every day, uh, the top management, to try to deal with this and understand uh, what they imply. There's absolutely no question that these are, are biting, that they are affecting uh, business in, in Russia. It's a completely different question whether it will be effective in changing behavior. And I, I think there's no evidence at the moment uh, that, they, that they are. You do want sanctions to get tougher, Andrew, yes, as sir. you just argued in a Chatham House publication. Well, at the very least, they should be maintained. Yeah. Um, do you think there's unanimity across the EU? Do you think Germany really backs sanctions? German business community? Well, not everybody is going to back sanctions. I can think of former British ambassadors to Moscow who do not, for example. Um, <laughs> hold, hold, hold on. Sorry, Ed, please go on. Sorry. <laughs> I, I would just like to take up one point that, that Ben raised. He talked about convergence. Mm. I think the whole trouble with Russia is Russia is not on a path of convergence towards the rule of law, secure property rights, yeah. rational f uh, fiscal systems, uh, banishing corruption, and so on. Eastern Europe made it. Russia has not. Can I just point out, Liam, um, mm. that this idea that the Germans are instinctively pro-Russian, German business, um, Germany now does more trade with Poland with $83 billion, including energy, than it does with Russia with $82 billion, including energy. And the, the You just had a big group of, Russia, of German economists calling for, for more trade links to the East, calling for them to join uh, uh, the uh, European, the, the economic union that Russia's forming with uh, China and India. Well, Liam, as you and I are both economists, and we know there is no idea so stupid that you can't find some economists sure. to support they're pretty, it. <laughs> they're pretty, pretty, pretty heavy people. It's the, I, feel I think Mrs. Merkel is even heavier, and I think it's absolutely astonishing the way that Mrs. Merkel, despite the opposition within her own party, within institutional Germany, within her coalition partners, and with again, public opinion, and in the EU, particularly with Italy, has still managed to drag the EU in the direction of sanctions. Whether that will survive the election of the Dave Spark party in Greece, I'm not sure. What do you make, Pippa, of the fact that in response to Western sanctions, far from uh, towing the Western line, the likes of China have signed big gas deals with Russia ostensibly since the sanctions, uh, audaciously if you like. Um, you had uh, uh, Modi in uh, India yeah. tweeting in Russian how much he wants to stay close to Ru Russia uh, during the Putin visit uh, to, to, to Delhi recently. Do you think that sanctions from the West have pushed together the emerging markets to work together more closely? And I would say the fact that Germany kicked out the CIA station chief and the 10 top people there was a similar phenomena yeah. connected yeah. to that as well. I would go a little further and say what we're witnessing is the greater the economic pain, the more the inclination to engage in a military response. So it is our assumption that economic sanctions demand economic answers, but that's not true. If you're conducting statecraft, you have all the tools of the state at your disposal. So I think we're going to see a much stronger response on the military side, and that will include the threat, and, uh, the threat of nuclear weapons, which is already in play with all the air incursions that we've seen into NATO airspace where we don't know whether they are fully loaded or not. So our side is having to respond as if they are, which of course means that what they're doing is applying the Reagan tactics to us, i.e. force you to spend a ton of money on defense at a time when your economy is down. So it's ironic because both Russia and China view the U.S. as a borrower that is dependent on their largesse. Right. The U.S., of course, if you say to an average American, you know, you depend on Chinese money, they're like, what? They have no idea that they're depending on foreigners for their capital uh, account balance. So we have a disconnect in, in several ways on these issues. And emerging markets are, in general, aligned with Pippa, with can Russia. I just make a very brief point? Pippa, isn't it a well-known, uh, when I was studying economics, as indeed Liam did a long time ago. Um, not as long ago as you, though. Not long ago as <laughs> yeah, no, um, you. Um, if, you, if, you if, if you owe the, if you owe the bank a million, a million dollars, you've got a problem. But if you, if you owe the bank $10 million, the bank's got a problem. And so isn't, isn't the real story that the the, the Chinese have an enormous interest in keeping the world financial system going, whereas the, uh, Rus uh, uh, the, Rus uh, uh, the Russians are rather isolated 
from it and are not able to, to, to borrow and engage in the same way. And the Chinese regard the Russians as incompetent, nutty, fascist gangsters, and I think they're probably right. Well, the gangster element's definitely in play, but I would say this, in a book that I've just written, what I've argued is both Russia and China see the efforts by the industrialized world to generate inflation, even if it's failing now. It is a form of default, not only in financial terms, but its purpose is to destabilize their economies by raising the cost of hard assets, forcing wages up, which has happened, pushing, for example, manufacturing out of China back to places like the Midlands, which is in play. So they see it as a, it, it's the, what they call the Goldfinger problem. If you remember, Goldfinger says to James Bond, once is coincidence, twice happenstance, three times is enemy action. In the West, you always default on your debt by using inflation, and you are already destabilizing our markets. We see inflation in Russia racing to 17%. They may be wrong in attributing that to the West, but they will anyway. Ben, you, you live in Moscow. How are sanctions going down? The views that Pip has put forward, they're pretty mainstream views in Russia. Right? Sanctions will not change Putin's mind at all. It'll have no effect. If anything, uh, Putin, for the first time in his career, 14 years, is vulnerable because he came to power and he's popular on the prosperity that he brought. Under Yeltsin, people's average income was about 50 bucks. Today is about 900 bucks. In PPP terms, that's $24,000 a year. They are the best off of all. The Russia is the only country, according to the UNDP, that is now in the high income bracket. It is now an emerged market. The other emerging markets are still emerging. And the sanctions are seen by the Russians as an attack on Russia, which it is. Um, and the, they, they're going to make no difference at all. And on the ground, it's made very little difference to people's lives. Cars have become more expensive. Holidays have become more expensive. But people don't care about that. If anything, they've rallied behind Putin and they've made him stronger. And this is all totally counterproductive. And why are we talking about sanctions in the first place? We should be talking about how we got into this position. Because my view is that this is a massive geopolitical mistake. To, to Putin was, was with the whole Ukraine thing. Anything you can say bad about Russia, you can say about Ukraine, and it's twice as bad in Ukraine. And yet, it's deemed to be suitable to be a close European Union partner. Ukraine? Ukraine. Does not have a president who got to power by killing several hundred of his own people in 1999, which was stated we, today in the High Court in this country. The EU deal with Ukraine was cut with Yanukovych. Sorry? Yanukovych. The deal with Ukraine was cut with Yanukovych, who is the biggest gangster of all the leaders. And, now he's, and we and now were deemed. He's gone. Yeah, but the, the deal was cut with Yanukovych. The EU was willing mm -hmm. to accept Yanukovych as a partner. Okay, with all I, will, I will bring you in, Sir Audrey, and then Sir, Sir Andrew. Uh, too many things to talk about, yeah. but first about geopolitics. It's good debate. Right. <laughs> uh, about geopolitics, the Chinese and the Indians would have been crazy not to try and make hay as a result of the row between the West and Russia. That's called geopolitics. It seems to me there's nothing very odd about that, um, first point. Second point, do we really know about Putin and what he's intending to do and what he isn't? I mean, do we really know that the, what's happening in Russia, the deal that he offered, okay, you blame it on the West. He offered prosperity, gave prosperity. Prosperity's going down, it's all the fault of the West. In two years' time, what effect's that gonna have? Third point I'd like to pick up is the nuclear threat. I simply don't believe it. This is not the Cold War. It is not the hair trigger confrontation. There are boats moving around loaded with nuclear missiles which could deal with any threat from Russia at the drop of a hat. I don't think that's part of the story at the moment. Sir Andrew? I agree, I agree with Roderick. Um, Ukraine is, is in some ways a basket case, but it is a basket case with some options for change. Russia is a basket case which is denying itself the options for change. Putin came back this last time determined to make it more state-run, to make it more concentrated on a very few people, and determined to stop the public debate, which is necessary for proper change. And this is the reason why he's in trouble. Secondly, the um, financial constraints on him are on the increase. His reserves are going down markedly. No one, Russians included, is investing in Russia. 
work. Therefore, it'll certainly be his, his, his uh, uh, aim to try to persuade us he will never change sanctions or no sanctions. That's perfectly rational, but he's then facing the possibility of collapse. Will Putin change because of sanctions? Surely the Russians just circle the wagons when they're, when they're put under pressure. So definitely yes, but bottom line, I want to come back to this point about the nature of the geopolitical conflict. This conflict may be fought with new weapons, but it is still a confrontation, and they will be in space, cyberspace, and underwater. And I want to point out an event that occurred this last summer that's critical to understand. During the largest military naval exercises Russia has held since the Cold War in the Baltic, during which time the submarine went missing in Stockholm, there was also now a revelation by the Danish intelligence authorities that the Russians simulated an attack on Bornholm, an island in the Baltic. During the very week, the Danish hold their equivalent of Davos, where every major political leader is on that island, to raise the simple question. If Denmark were attacked in whatever way with whatever kind of weapons, would NATO and the United States respond? And the answer in most inner circles is no. And so part of this is about testing what will be the response. Michael's been very patient. My apologies, Michael. There, there, seem, there, there seem to be two mutual, which I, I think mutually exclusive uh, points of view. Uh, one is that if Russia is cornered, uh, if uh, Putin feels that his popularity is suffering, uh, he turns to foreign aggression. So sanctions are therefore uh, counterproductive. I take the opposite view. Whether or not it actually deters him, it does take away the tools for him to do a lot of the things that he would otherwise want to do. You notice that he tends to be more aggressive when the oil price is high. Um, I would rather spend tr treasure now, and in fact, the fact that it hurts the West is part of what gives it, uh, gives these kinds of policies uh, a, 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 a certain uh, amount of, uh, of power, uh, rather than have to sp spend blood later. Uh, I'm a little curious what, what, you, what uh, Pippa said about uh, the perception that the West is somehow planning to default on all of this debt that it's produced. Uh, because if you look, actually, uh, this is just an aside, if you look at the maturity structure of U.S. debt, I mean, that's not possible. Mm. Even if they, like, they would like to do it, they really can't. But isn't that how we got out of our debts at the end of the Second World War? We just inflated them away, right? Well, you could if American you had th everything yeah. in the It always War. happens. People okay. I'm looking sorry, for the, sorry, someone from the audience sorry, who, wants, who wants to... Who, Can I just who, come first on the news? You will. You will. Who wants to... Anybody who wants to say a word against sanctions on Russia? Edward. Um, just getting back to the nukes, we've seen a dummy nuclear attack on Warsaw in 2009. We've seen a dummy attack on Stockholm. We've seen the attack on Bornholm. Russia is investing very heavily in tactical nuclear weapons, which are exactly the sort of small nukes that the West no longer, largely no longer has. Now, this may just be bluff. Yeah, it's an open discussion why they are doing this, but they regularly rehearse loading them up onto delivery vehicles, and they regularly rehearse exercises in, 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 in which they are used against but the Ed, it's not, enemy. It's and not, and I, I think you have to say that is at least an element of this hybrid warfare which Russia is practicing against the West, along with organized crime, corruption, propaganda, financial sanctions, energy sanctions, and all the, and all the other things. It's ask, yourself, ask yourself okay, why they're rearming. I mean, it's not an open discussion. I mean, again, and I don't necessarily condone the Russian military buildup, nor the aggression. No, however, from the Russian perspective, it's quite clear they feel threatened. America is the most belligerent country in the world. It's got into how many... Yeah, the, the Kremlin feels threatened. They feel threatened because they see NATO moving in two waves up to their border, and you can tell them to your blue in the face that doesn't mean that they're going to be attacked. Nevertheless, they see it as a military organization moving up to their border. The, and the key thing here you have to bear in mind is that the United States pulled out of the ABS, the Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty, which secured missile security in Europe. And the Russians are seriously freaked out by that. And so Putin is now investing money, which he shouldn't be, into the military because he feels threatened. And we've done nothing to reassure him that we're not being aggressive. America, as I said, has started all these wars. They're looking at that, and they're saying, we could be next. Ben, that's such rubbish. You should be ashamed of saying it. Okay, no, I'm not ashamed. He's he's saying saying what is happening. And you mustn't, it's that, you mustn't <laughs> assume bad faith, Edward, because you know, he spent a lot, lot longer living in Russia than you have. In the audience, we've got Mike, Mike, Mike Calvey. Uh, Mike, would you mind standing up? Mike Calvey um, runs a, a company called Bering Vostok, 
He spent many years living and working He's in Russia. He's the biggest investor in Russia. <laughs> so I think what's missing from this discussion is uh, uh, trying to understand the difference between uh, punishing Russia and helping Ukraine. So uh, there's no question that the sanctions are having a, a, a negative effect on Russia's economy and the investment climate. And if that's the only goal, then they're succeeding. But so far, it doesn't seem like it's helping Ukraine and maybe actually making things worse. And the second point, I think, is about how uh, personalized Western policy has become about Putin himself. Mm. There is no strategy. What, what is the West trying to actually achieve? Uh, if Putin died in a plane crash tomorrow, and somebody else, whoever, took over and actually pursued the same uh, apparent objectives of Russia about Ukraine. My guess is that it would be easy for Western leaders to agree with that, uh, that person very quickly. Uh, has anyone asked, does Russia have any legitimate reason to oppose what's happening in Ukraine? NATO expansion, you know, if, if, if Ukraine becomes part of the European Union and Russia doesn't, does, does, does Russia have any legitimate reasons to oppose that? I think that because it's uh, Vladimir Putin who's become such a radioactive and toxic person for some reasons which are understandable, that n n no Western leader can, can discuss these issues. But if it wasn't him, if it was just Russia, I think people would look at it very differently and actually find that Russia does have legitimate reasons to be upset about what's happening in Ukraine. Thank you, Mike. Sir Roderick, briefly, and then Dan Wolf. Well, fairly briefly. <laughs> uh, the question of NATO, Ukraine, and Article 5 have been raised, and they're very important ones. Uh, NATO is either a military alliance or it's a club for helping old ladies cross the road. Um, Article 5 is crucial. Somebody is attacked, we will rally around and defend them. Bringing countries into NATO, which we have ne neither the means, nor the will, nor the ge geography, to defend is a pretty, in my view, irresponsible thing to do. We've done it for Poland, we've done it for the Balts, and we have an absolute obligation to them, and I hope we have serious military plans for defending Estonia, but I'd like to know what they are. Uh, we couldn't have done it for Georgia. It was irresponsible to dangle membership in front of Georgia, and in my view, the whole question of how we could have defended a country of which more than half the population didn't want to join NATO is an important question. Ukraine is a complicated and fragile country, and the way people in the West talk about it, you wouldn't know that. Um, and that's, that's the question of how you help Ukraine in these circumstances is the real question. And you get into the question, how much money we're prepared to spend on it? And the answer is very little, actually. And are we, allow, are we prepared to allow Ukraine into the EU, given their agricultural prowess? I put that uh, well, out there. I think uh, and, and then we have Jens Stoltenberg um, uh, last, or in the wake of the Charlie Hebdo attacks, of course, the, the Secretary General of NATO calling Moscow an ally in the fight against terrorism. Dan Wolf, um, who spent many years also living and working in, in Russia. You know, I just want to, one of the things that surprises me about all the anti-Putin rhetoric, which is extreme, you know, particularly in the United States, where you know, I recently was meeting with some members of a state-owned Russian bank who told me Putin is evil and must be stopped. You know, I'm like, you basically work for him. <laughs> but uh, one of the things that, that's most interesting to me is, although we can be assured there will not be a free and open election in Russia tomorrow with full uh, candidate slates and, and, you know, full access to the press, I have no doubt that if there was, Putin would win. He is the leader of Russia, and that seems to have been lost. The other thing that I think is interesting in all of this is... Do you, you think know, the elections are roughly fair? He is the most popular politician in Russia? No question. No question. That's you know, and part, part, partly <laughs> Russian cynicism because they don't know that the next guy would be better. Well, yes, the elections were observed by international... But it doesn't matter. If they were free, he would still win. That's that my point. That may be true. But, 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 but more, more, important, more importantly, my question is this. Um, there's a couple of things that seem perfectly clear to me, more important even than what Sir Roderick said. Russia will allow NATO to be in Ukraine only through a battle against Russia. That's clear to me, and I don't think for Putin or the next leader that's going to be negotiable. And secondly, we have to somehow on some level accept that Crimea will be Russian for many, many years. And it seems to me the failure to recognize those 
you know, unfortunate facts, however much you don't like them, is one that has allowed us to push more aggression into Ukraine. You know, the, the joke in Moscow is Russia and Ukraine are ready to fight to the last in Ukraine, to the last Ukrainian. Can I follow up on that? Um, the, it's actually the answer to Mike's uh, question, why is Russia interested in Ukraine? Ukraine represents two of Russia's key strategic assets. One was the gas pipeline. Half its exports to West go through this gas pipeline. The second was the naval base at Serapopol, which is this major warm water base. I put it to you if you tried to take you know, the Hawaiian base or Guam base away from America because they decided to change sides, America would go to war over that. In fact, they threaten war over Cuba, which is pretty much the same setup. And this is the cause of Russia's or immediate uh, aggression against Ukraine and specifically against the Crimea, was to secure their major military asset. Okay, Sir, Sir Andrew, thank you for your patience. Then Eric. There are so many issues that have come up. First of all, NATO membership for Ukraine is a remote possibility mm. and is not the root cause of the conflict. Yeah. Secondly, of course people concentrate on Putin because he's the single most important factor around which uh, politics in Russia evolve. Thirdly, I'm glad that somebody raised the question of uh, Putin would be succeeded by somebody else and what would that mean? It would mean something different. Nobody becomes CEO of a major company or president of a, of, a, of a country without changing things. As soon as you begin to change things in Russia, people are going to suffer around the president. It would, the system is incapable of change. Uh, the, the, the scary thing, though, about, um, about this scenario of uh, Putin uh, going down an airplane is that we may, miss, in fact, miss him when he's gone yeah. because he has not created the institutions no, uh, to ensure that his successor will be any better, he may be a great deal worse. Indeed. And Eric, that's part of the Eric's problem. Eric's being extremely polite, and yeah. I'm going to reward his politeness. Thank you very much. So, so um, I think there's no question. Okay, that's enough. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's no question that uh, we are in a downward spiral, and I think we can do whatever we want to amplify it in this discussion. I think the as I said in the initially, we need to find a way back. And I think there is a way back here. And I think it has to do with Ukraine. Uh, I think we need to find areas where there is a sort of positive sum game, things that are in the interest of Russia, in, in the interest of Ukraine. I can sh tell you a little bit about, for example, conversations in the Ukrainian banking sector where the Russian banks are, are very present. They are trying to play game. They are coming. Uh, to, uh, to meet in there, trying to be a constructive force. I think there is trade possibilities to start a conversation. I'm, I'm not denying that these other conflicts are probably of first order, but we need to find some kind of conversations where we engage. Bravo. And we could this. Stand up, please. John Hogarth, um, b &E. A question to Ben and Pippa, if possible. You both mentioned that um, sanctions against Russia um, actually had the opposite effect because, if anything, it made people support Putin even more. It made uh, countries in the region um, r um, ally with Russia <laughs> and the emerging market sort of staying stronger together. Um, um, so it's almost like a um, camp of Russia and the uh, emerging markets against America. Isn't it time for America to sort of review its policy of, in terms of sanctions. I mean, if Russia was a bit smaller, weaker, it would have probably what, start bombing it. In the end, Pippa, don't our kids and grandkids need to trade with these countries? They're Isn't more it than time half the GDP, they've got three quarters of reserves, so four-fifths of the population. Okay, so I think that it's one time the... for America to, sort of, to stop um, yeah. pushing or bullying. Um, it, it's almost like it's, it is bullying, the, the emerging banks, particularly <laughs> Russia. <laughs> so, so one of the interesting issues uh, is that it, Americans are incredulous at the notion that somebody out there uses something other than a US dollar. There's this monopoly money out there. They don't know really what it is. So the idea that the world will turn to some other currency basket is a non-compute for your average American. The second thing is also the Americans, we only see ourselves in a, in a nice light. So. We think that the post-war international economic order does indeed serve everyone's interests. The difficulty is that coincidentally, many emerging markets are concluding that it is not serving their interests simultaneously. 
and the U.S. doesn't have a really great response for that. But to that end, I would move the debate a little bit, by the way, away from the concept of the new Cold War, which actually I don't disagree has this connotation of being about mutual assured destruction of nuclear weapons positioning. And instead, ask the question, is this more like the new great game, where the superpowers are entering into a competition for access to and control over supply chains of resources, and that causes China and Russia to align together to a large degree. And second, that it's about things like what caused the oil price to fall. Was that that, that Saudi saw the United States wanting to cut a deal with Iran, they don't want that to happen because that's a mortal threat for them. Russia is the second biggest threat to them and they can kill all that with one move, drive the oil price down and push back the fracking production in the United States simultaneously. So suddenly the way the Russians view it is this great game is unfolding partly because the American president is naive and not paying attention, not because he's aggressive. And I would say at the bottom of all this is a view commonly held by Russia and China that we can do anything we want for the next two years because your guy won't respond to any of it. That may be wrong, but that's their perception. Liam, just one just, second. I, I what, just, sorry, this guy's been very, very okay, patient. Please. Could you tell us who you are, please? You know, <clears throat> I know Putin for about 10 years. I've been working in Kremlin for 20 years. And uh, uh, I know these people, and I'm against, of course, Putin. That's why I'm living here. But <laughs> first, Putin is not the man who, and I know I'm speaking, and uh, I know what I'm speaking about. Putin is not a man who will invent something new. He's reacting, but he's reacting clever. Whatever he does, his reaction, he's forced to act. This is one point. Second point. <clears throat> Uh, you are all forgetting about one thing, say, speaking about Ukraine. Ukraine. Ukraine in Russia and in Kremlin is considered to be a Russian world. And you are forgetting about Orthodox Church. Because all the sacred places, all the cathedrals, they belong to Orthodox Church, Russian Orthodox Church. And if Putin agrees to what you are asking, stop and sell in Russia, is sell Novorossiya, he will be out, his life will be finished, and he will be absolutely hated by 90% of Russians. So you should understand that he has no way out but to fight. And here you should put a stop. Because if he is forced to use nuclear weapons, he will use nuclear weapons without any doubt. That is uh, regarding sanctions. I, I, very well informed because I was working there with the construction or with agriculture. Russian peasants for 25 years and Russian farmers were asking to cut the corruption ties and links between the Western supplies of products, agricultural products, and Russian uh, chain and retails. Putin has done this after 25 years of pressure of Russian farmers because of the, of the sanctions of the West. Second point, just an example. Siemens was the biggest, say for example, competitor and uh, had biggest share in the supply chain, for example, of electric equipment. Now, Siemens, for the contracts which Siemens is signing in Russia and still signing in Russia, is buying the production not from the German factories but from Russian factories. And Russian producers of electric equipment next uh, year for 19, uh, I mean, uh, 2015. They'll, they've got 40% increase in contracts already. Which sanction are you speaking about? Ben, you wanted to come back? I, I just wanted to pick up on Pippa's point. Uh, I actually should say you should listen to Sergei. He worked in both the Yeltsin and the Putin administrations. Uh, the, the great game that we did a more recent cover story saying exactly this. This is not a Cold War. This is more of a great game because Russia is not isolated that it is in conflict with America and some countries in Europe. But it's, this whole conflict is driving Russia into the arms of the other emerging markets. We've got a new BRIC development bank. We've got infrastructure. We've got open statements of support from the Chinese and from Brazil. And the, Russia is just driving them the globalization you know, in the other direction. 
And this is going to be a huge geopolitical mistake on the part of the West, is to drive all these countries into a block against them, or at least in counterbalance to them. And the evidence of this is already transparent in so much as uh, in 2008, China, China did none of its trade settlement in Wuhan, and now it does a quarter of its settlement in Wuhan, and Russia has been the most active in setting up that one ruble trade, and the dollar is doomed. The gentleman here has been very patient, and then the gentleman at the end in glasses, and I, in the middle, Sir Roderick. I, I'm glad that um, several people have mentioned the great game, um, because I want to ask the panel, where do they think Putin's ambition ends? In September, he said that Kazakhstan had never been a nation. What did he mean by that? Well, I, I, I wanted to... I wanted to say how good it is to hear a Russian speaking, because we all bang on about how knowledgeable we are about this country, but, and we think these people don't know what they're talking about. They're all mad. They're Russians. Actually, listening to what they say is something we need to do, and trying to understand why they're saying it is what, even if we don't like the conclusions we reach. And understanding does not mean forgiving, Ed. It's necessary if you're going to craft any kind of a sensible policy. So I hope there are some of your compatriots here who will also speak out now. Are there any Ukrainians here? That would be nice. <laughs> okay, there's a Ukrainian here. There's a gent young Ukrainian on, on the front here, just quickly, and then we'll go to the chap uh, on, on the edge there. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. No, no. Thank you very much for a great discussion. Half of my family is Ukrainian, half is Russian. And my question for you is, why does someone here in London has to decide about my family's destiny? And my other question is, I'm 22, my dad spent half of his life working hard for me to go here and study in London School of Economics to get an amazing degree and have the privilege to be talking to you. And why is a time like this when we have the turbulence international relations? You know what's the day today, the liberation of Auschwitz. My grand-grandfather spent his life going all the way down from Rostov to Berlin. And I remember him telling me the story of how the whole liberation was done. Yet today, when the celebration is there in Poland, my president of my country, Russia, was never invited. Why is this happening? Can I ask? And my grandfather, for example, who died in this And do you mind last... It's very nice to have you, you to invite someone to speak on behalf of Ukraine and have someone say, oh yes, my president from Russia. And one last question. I would love to support Ben. My country was under attack for the past 200 years, three times, and my population lost 26 million of lives, if we take official statistics, 68 if we take Alexander Solzhenitsyn. Don't we have a reason to be afraid? Okay, Thank pass you. the mic there. Go. Do you want to speak? I don't have anything else to add. You don't, you don't have anything to say? To say. Right. Okay, the mic there with the gentleman in the glasses. You had your chance. <laughs> Thank you, Liam. Um, yeah. One of the big differences between now and the Cold War is that we actually know what people think in Moscow. We can follow it on Twitter, we can read the internet, we're very familiar with what's going on. Uh, uh, in Russia. So my question, and um, we've had some modest Russian voices here, but it's interesting that there aren't any Russian voices on the panel, uh, would be, what does the panel think uh, progressive, uh, uh, liberal Russians uh, uh, who are not necessarily uh, supporters of Putin, but on the other hand are Russian patriots and who love their country, what should they be doing to pursue the broadly progressive aims which many of the panelists seem to be thinking they should be pursuing? Thank you. Sir Andrew. You've been very patient, thank you. Primarily, they should be thinking about the way Russia governs itself. The way Russia governs itself is deeply corrupted, deeply unstable, and very bad if you're thinking of Russian interests. I cannot see that it's in Russian interests, though I can see it might be in the Kremlin's interests, to wage an aggressive war against Ukraine. Russian interests will be served by Ukraine and Russia working together. This is not an issue between the East and the West, it's been forced into that mold by uh, uh, the Russian propaganda, but it's not. It's a question of the right of Ukrainians to govern their own country. It, Russia, the Orthodox Church in Ukraine is pretty divided as it happens. Russia has no right to dictate what Kiev should do. And that is the principle we're trying to defend. But isn't it so, the question between Russia and Ukraine? To sort out without the West getting yes, but the way they tried to sort it out was to encourage uh, Mr. Yanukovych to, to uh, kill his. How would the military act if, if Russia got into. Uh, That's absolutely irrelevant, I'm sorry. In, in it's got nothing to do with it. 
But, 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 but between Russia and, and the United States. Can we just bring in Christopher Granville, who who's also spent many years living uh, in Russia? Thank, well, thanks, Liam. Both as a diplomat and a businessman. I, I'm sure that lots of my fellow audience members would join me in congratulating Eric Bergloff mm. in being the only panelist to, answer, to ask the right question, uh, what is to be done, and then to try and answer it. Mm. I mean, the other panelists have Im implicitly answered it uh, in different ways. Some have said that one thing to be done would be to wait for sanctions to bring Putin down in flames, and then there's an argument about whether that will happen, how long, what the collateral risks might be. But Eric has proposed more concrete and immediate actions uh, in the trade and financial sphere with which I think any sensible person would agree. And I was wondering if he and other, all other panelists would agree with an additional thing which could be done immediately, which is to enter into an overarching, legally binding, treaty-based strategic accommodation with Russia on European security, military deployments, uh, regional concentration of forces, all under the inspection regime. Uh, that, uh, in my opinion, would solve the matter. Gentlemen here, thank you, Christopher. And then, and then, and then um, Edward will come back. My name is Alexander Eustrahan. We've been doing business with uh, Russia as investment bankers, as investors since '89. Older than anyone, that's why I know so for some time. Um, I think it's very important to look uh, back for a minute. Um, and I'd like to ask the very knowledgeable panel a question. Let's cast our eyes uh, back to October 2013. Ukraine negotiates with the EU, possible this association agreement, etc., etc. Ukraine raises, and one can argue whether it was valid or not, or it, we need a lot of money, we're going to lose a lot of trade with Russia, etc., etc. And then uh, one of the Western leaders, I can't remember exactly, but somebody very senior, basically said, come on, other chorus, we're not going to auction for Ukraine. Basically, we're not going to give any serious money. Some small amounts were promised, but they were insignificant. Uh, here comes Putin, puts $15 billion on a t dollars on the table, $3 billion disbursed immediately, Yanukovych changes his tack. Uh, we all know what happened after that. Maidan, uh, 100 people dead, Yanukovych out, etc., etc. More people dead now. Let's look back. Is the West better off now, uh, because it looks to me like now the West is forced to give much more than 15 billion, basically, one way or another, significantly more. I don't even know the number. Well, nobody knows the number. So if we try to analyze, remembering the famous maxim that don't who don't learn the history how to repeat it, what do you, uh, very knowledgeable people, think? Had the West not basically been skimpy, or whatever the right word would be, and uh, basically put the money back in October 2013. Would we be where we are? Or perhaps the situation would have been very different. No Crimea, no Donetsk, no way down. Edward, uh, thank you. I, th I think the history of Western engagement in this part of the world is a catalogue of, of huge mistakes, and I'd be rash to pick out one in particular. But certainly, we failed to take Ukraine seriously, particularly failed to make a serious offer of eventual EU membership, which might have been some kind of catalyzer. We missed the opportunity of the Orange Revolution. But I want to come back to a very important point that was made by Daniel Wolf about whether Putin's popular. And I think the question you have to ask is, if we still had the media that we had in 1999, if we still had the old NTV, Yevgeny Kisilov, Itogi, all those different product, uh, programs, if we had the wide range of probing, questioning media, what questions would they be asking Putin and what answers would he give? What would happen, for example, if you had a serious investigation into the apartment bombings? What would happen if you had a serious investigation into the way in which these big Russian energy companies sell their um, oil and gas in such mysterious ways, so hugely to the benefit of Kremlin insiders? What would happen if you had a serious investigation into the grotesque wealth, this $2 billion palace, for example? And I think what would happen if you had an investigation into the corruption of institutions? What would happen if you had an investigation into the way in which the political parties system has been destroyed, and the way the court system has been destroyed, and the way in which infrastructure modernization has been so weak, and so many of the promises made by Putin haven't been fulfilled? Into the nanotechnology program, which had one great success, it shrank the ruble. Into Skolkovo, this great idea of having a Russian Silicon Valley, which is still just a field outside Moscow. If you put those questions to Putin and his gang, and you had a real alternative with opposition politicians who, unlike Alexei Navalny, were actually allowed 
to go and campaign properly, then I'm not sure that Putin would be so popular. And in answer to the question from my fellow alumnus from LSE, I completely agree with you. All we are asking is that Kiev and the Ukrainians should be allowed to determine their country's destiny. That's all we want. If they want to join the Eurasian Economic Union or the Intergalactic Union or want to affiliate to Mars, that's their sovereign choice. It's the sole principle which we are standing up for. Your country and your people should decide, not have bits bitten off you by a bigger neighbour. And finally, I just want to say an answer to, to Chris Granville. I contest the idea that no one's coming up with a practical programme. I think your practical programme is completely wrong. And we offered um, a, a security structure, and Russia habitually evaded and tried to undermine it, which is why the OSC doesn't work anymore, and why we no longer have a CFE. Hold, hold on. So, hold wait, hold wait, on. Final, point. Final, final point. Very, very, good. Yeah. What, very simple. What we have to do is we have to constrain Russia and bolster the countries that are under threat. That's all we can do. Sir Roderick, go. let's just hear a response to... Well, just on the history. Um, in 1991, Gorbachev asked for $13 billion, and we said he hadn't reformed the economy, so we wouldn't give it to him. In January 1992, Yeltsin, with Gaidar reforming the economy, asked for $13 billion, and we said, sorry, we have economic <laughs> problems, and we can't afford it. Mm -hmm. So this is action replay, if you like, with Ukraine. Uh, secondly, on the security treaty, I do think Christopher's idea is charming, but I think it's entirely unattainable at the moment. And um, various efforts were made and various proposals were made in the 90s for a security structure for Europe, which would include Russia, which we always turned down for reasons which you will remember. So I don't think that's going to happen very soon, ideal though it would be. Very, very briefly, sir. Uh, We may criticize Putin uh, very, uh, very much and uh, a lot of, but you should understand one thing. And I've been there, that's why I, am, I know these people whom we are speaking about. Putin is much better from the point of view of Russia, of any opposition leader in, in Russia now, including Navalny, for example, or Nimtsov. I am telling you 100% that the system was much worse during Yeltsin. It was absolutely, because I had conflict in Kremlin in 1994 with the head of security organization. And I know how it was to get out of this. This is one thing. The, the, the most important thing what West should do is to concentrate on the raising of the opposition to regime and not to Putin. And you are supporting only people who start speaking, we are anti-Putin, we are against him, and you are supporting them. But the opposition who is against the regime and wants to change the system, you are not supporting. And this is the problem. Who should we support? No, let us discuss after this. Right? <laughs> 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 we are support, but the, because there is no support. That there is a, uh, uh, it was con a concentration of the assistance or support in the hands of the same criminals, which are like Putin. This is the end of the Russian opposition. We could go on for hours. I'm going to ask each member of the panel just to give us a 30-second final thought because we're so far over time and we can have beer and food and, and carry on. Michael, um, I do apologise for not bringing Well, I, I'm rather sad that there are only three people from Russia and I think we should do something to ensure that there are more. This is one area where Ed and I probably disagree. Uh, when you travel there, one thing that you notice is there are a lot of very highly educated people who would love to come to the West. And one way to sort of combat the regime is to make uh, visas, make the possibility of coming to work and study and settle here in the, in the West uh, easier. Not every person who arrives here is going to be another Andre Geim, but by and large, that flow of talent, of that human capital that's largely wasted back in Russia, uh, would only make Western economies more prosperous. Thank and it would also raise the question of why is the intelligentsia of Russia actually leaving? I want to follow up on Chris Granville's point uh, in so much as the Russians themselves went to uh, Germany in 2008 and proposed to a new pan-European security pact. Their argument was since the end of the Cold War, there are no rules anymore and that we need to put them in place. And the structure of the proposal they were making would have actually tied their hands and prevented them from doing what happened in Ukraine. And this was rejected out of hand by Brussels. 
I, I maintain that, that, that the Russians, uh, well, if you listen to the Russians, they can continuously say that Europe is our natural partner. And I also want to follow on with Eric's point, and he, he has the answer. The answer is, and happily is happening in but uh, ineffective form, is EU, EEU, Eurasia Economic Union, to do a trade pact, because if we unite this, the comparative advantage, economic prosperity, will get rid of all of this, and the whole Ukraine issue will become irrelevant, because it sits in the middle of a larger, prosperous Europe that stretches from uh, Lisbon to Vladivostok. Uh, this is a solution. Sir Andrew. It's not a solution because while Putin is there, Russia will not be prosperous, and because uh, the uh, it is prosperous already. It is not prosperous already. It's in, in extreme difficulty already. People are prosperous. The, some people in Russia are prosperous. We wish there were more of them over here. I thoroughly agree with that point. I believe that that uh, we're not in a new normal. We're in a new crisis, which we don't know the end of it yet. But it is going to be very difficult. Eric, thank you for your patience. So um, I think what what's happening right now is that we're reinforcing all the bad trades in, in Russia. We are, with this discussion, just making things worse. I think the solution is much more about trying to do the right thing in Ukraine. If Ukraine manages to, to get through this very difficult transition, if we are giving them the, the sufficient financial support that they need, and they have a new government that's very committed to reform, facing uh, really difficult circumstances, if we can help Ukraine get through this, I think that's the road to cha real change in Russia as well. Thank you. Throughout history, geopolitics has been about the pursuit of national interests. And I think we are blinded by the fact that we had a booming world economy in which everyone felt their national interests were being served. And when it wasn't booming anymore, it revealed that not everybody's national interests were being served as well as they would like. So one of the solutions is nations begin to pursue their own agenda. And we attribute that to the personality of the leader. But I would argue, actually, economic stress is causing consolidation of power under Xi Jinping. And even President Obama is, re is ruling by executive order, centralizing power in a US context as well. And as this happens, it makes it harder to resolve. So bottom line, I would say we have to really understand the pursuit of national interest will take us way beyond Ukraine. And we should be paying attention to not only Russia's efforts to reach into the Arctic, to establish military power in the Baltics, to go negotiate with Egypt over the restoration of their port to control Eastern Mediterranean more than ever before. But we should also understand that China is doing exactly the same thing. So this is a global problem. It's not just about Russia. And it's really about the question of, does the international order we have today genuinely serve the interests of the participants? And if it doesn't, that's what we need to answer. Not something specific and bilateral, but something multilateral and a generalized question, I think. Edward? Um, I wrote the new Cold War in 2007, but I've been dealing with European security for more than 30 years. Um, this is a really bad situation, and it's getting worse. We're losing not because we're weak. We are a $20 trillion economy, $40 trillion if you include America, and Russia is between $1 and $2 trillion, depending on how you count it. We're losing this because our willpower is weak, but we are losing. And I'm really sorry that in all this discussion, we didn't have someone from one of the former captive nations, such as Ukraine or the Baltic states, giving their point of view about how they feel sitting on the edge of the volcano like this. There are actually many in the audience, Ed. Yes, I'm free to put their hand up. Yeah, I'm just sorry. sorry. I'm just sorry we didn't hear that so viewpoint. Up, but you have I've, <laughs> I'm married to a Russian. Yeah. I think that's unfair. My two children, of six and nine, are actually being educated in Petrushkolia in Saint Petersburg. Donald Riley. So you're one of about 20 people who put their hand up and didn't get called, okay? And would you now let Sir Roderick finish your, the debate? Your, your, On the panel. Oh, can we say by marriage also? Sorry. <laughs> well, I want to Thanks. say a number of things. First of all, I of course don't agree with Ed that we're losing the battle. That's, I hesitate to use a word like ridiculous, but it's the word I would use if I were to press it up. That's the first thing. Secondly, of course, Eric is right that we need to engage, and in the end, we will engage because all bad things come to an end, just like all good things, and we're going to move on to a new phase. And talking 
is going to have to be part of the next stage. Um, on prosperity in Russia, I think the statistics give a completely wrong impression. Uh, Russia is prosperous in places and very unprosperous in other places. And anybody who hasn't seen it should go and see Leviathan if he wants to know what Brilliant, life in the north is like. Um, finally, on Ukraine, iTunes. I don't want to narrow the debate too much, but we have, the Russians have done what they've done in Ukraine. We have, I think, mishandled the question right from the beginning. Not necessarily out of evil intent, as Russians think, but out of incompetence and ignorance. And I think getting Ukraine right, which includes giving a lot of money and support, and not necessarily taking them into NATO, because I'm not sure that will be, is part of the answer. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to thank all of our panellists. A fantastic uh, discussion. I'd like to thank Cass, in particular, Maria Marinescu and her team, uh, events team, for helping us working so hard to put this event together. I'd like to thank all of you, those of us joining on the live stream. There will be many more BNE Intelligent News debates to come here in London and elsewhere. We haven't solved the problems of the world, but at least we've be begun a discussion. We've opened a, a Pandora's box. Good. Thank you.